Why are you withdrawing money? To spend it. In an ironic incident at the Postal Bank of China, a man was questioned by a teller about the purpose of his withdrawal, to which he straightforwardly replied that he intended to use the money for shopping. This questioning puzzled him, as withdrawing money for personal use is a common practice. The bank's procedure is intended to curb and prevent criminal activities such as money laundering, but it has not been well received by the public. When asked about the purpose of his withdrawal, another man expressed his dissatisfaction by threatening to cancel his bank card. Cancel my card and give me my money back. I'm not leaving. Public opinion largely agrees that routine transactions should not require detailed explanations. People argue that their money is earned legally without theft or deceit, and that such questioning by bank staff invades personal privacy. Some netizens pointed out that while tellers may not take action regardless of the reason given, they are obligated to ask about the purpose of transactions. Otherwise, the bank might deduct their wages. Not only are withdrawals monitored, but surprisingly, banks in China have also started establishing armed divisions. The public was quite puzzled about who the perceived enemy is. On April 23rd, the state broadcaster in Xining, Qinghai Province, reported that on April 19th, the People's Armed Division of the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China's Qinghai branch was inaugurated in Xining, with local military and municipal leaders in attendance. Officials state that this People's Armed Division is the first grassroots armed division in national financial institutions, aligning with Xi Jinping's strong military ideology. Insiders from major state-owned banks have informed the media that some bank security departments now also manage local militia, and bank employees participate in militia training. The news of Shanghai Municipal Investment Group's establishment of a People's Armed Division on September 28, 2023, drew significant attention. This state-owned company, which focuses on real estate and investment, held the ceremony with both Chinese military officers and the company's executives present. Before this, several state-owned enterprises including about 10 in Wuhan and several in Huizhou, had established people's armed divisions. Among private enterprises, the dairy company Yili Group was among the first to set up such a division, and even universities like Tongji University in Shanghai, Wuhan University, and Southern Medical University have established military units. According to media analysis of Chinese state media reports and corporate data, at least several dozen state-owned enterprises have now established the People's Armed Division, a relic from the era of former CCP leader Mao Zedong, was originally established in June 1950. These divisions were widespread in Chinese counties and districts, but were incorporated into the military structure starting April 1, 1996. Following China's economic reforms, these units faded from public view and became inactive. The resurgence of the People's Armed Division reflects the CCP's leadership concerns about domestic stability amidst decreasing job opportunities, unstable incomes, and social unrest, particularly financial market instability that can negatively impact the economy and spark public dissent. According to data from the Hong Kong nonprofit organization China Labor Bulletin, there were 1,794 recorded incidents of collective worker actions in 2023, more than double the previous years. Manufacturing strikes increased significantly to 438 from 37 in 2022. Construction workers' protests were most frequent, totaling 945, and there were 208 in the service sector. The CCP's reestablishment of the People's Armed Division primarily aimed to preemptively address what it considers unstable factors that could lead to social unrest. While the primary duty of a national military is to maintain territorial integrity, sovereignty, and national security, and to defend against external threats and aggression, the establishment of the People's Armed Division appears more driven by concerns over potential domestic disturbances. This approach highlights the government's mistrust of the people and anxiety over social stability, undermining the trust between the government and its citizens. It is understood that last year, the cumulative debt of various governments in China reached a staggering 80 trillion yuan. To manage this enormous debt burden, the Chinese government has directed banks to purchase local government bonds, effectively transferring massive debts to these financial institutions. Simultaneously, the public has encountered numerous difficulties in withdrawing funds. As banks have redirected significant resources to local governments, they face the risk of substantial bad debts, leading to a liquidity crunch. Consequently, banks have implemented a series of measures to restrict customer withdrawals. 
In a related incident, a woman in Pingdingshan, Henan Province, faced an arduous process at Zhongyuan Bank when attempting to withdraw 5,000 yuan sent by her sister for distributing red envelopes during the Chinese New Year. The staff demanded she download an anti-fraud app and posed various questions, asking for details about her sister's employer, past employment history, and even proof of her sibling relationship. She was even asked to make a direct call to her sister and show their chat records, spending nearly two hours to complete the withdrawal. In response to such unreasonable demands from the authorities, numerous citizens have shown resistance. Recently, the Qingshuipu Service Department of the Guizhou Bijie Rural Consumer Cooperative was vandalized. Videos show the cooperative sign clearly visible with the interior in disarray, chairs overturned, and plant pots scattered. An anonymous depositor revealed that due to the inability to withdraw funds, people have become concerned about the safety of their deposits, leading to frequent unsuccessful attempts to withdraw money and resulting in regular conflicts. A local shop owner mentioned that he had deposited several thousand yuan in the cooperative, saying, I haven't been able to withdraw money for months, and it's not just me. Others with tens or even hundreds of thousands deposited face the same issue. Some criticized the Chinese Communist Party for generously funding foreign students while neglecting domestic banking responsibilities, causing suffering among the population. In this context, they argue, the Chinese regime will inevitably face the prospect of being overthrown. There are also indications that, as the real estate crisis persists, the banking sector has fallen into severe difficulty. To address this, the CCP introduced a whitelist system to housing enterprises prizes in securing financing. However, two months after the announcement of the whitelist, financing for 22 construction projects in Tianjin has still not materialized, with most projects still in the banking liaison stage and some even at risk of being removed from the list. Local banking insiders note that entry into the real estate whitelist is only the first step. The actual acquisition of financing largely depends on the financial institution screening. Experts point out that the CCP coercion of banks to participate in the whitelist system reflects immense governmental pressure. However, this approach is economically irrational and carries systemic risks. Experts believe that the depletion of assets, banks, and property enterprises stems from an abuse of power, now a systemic issue. The CCP is making concerted efforts to prevent financial risks, but the root problems lie in the misuse of power and the lack of checks and balances. This political system may lead to systemic corruption, asset depletion, and financial risks, issues that the CCP has yet to effectively address. Moreover, as the real estate sector continues to struggle, land disputes and unfinished building projects have become frequent, sparking waves of public protests. The number of unfinished buildings in China is alarmingly high. For example, the debt-ridden Chinese property developer Evergrande Group was declared bankrupt last month by the High Court of Hong Kong. According to estimates by mainland media, Evergrande has left behind about 1,300 unfinished buildings, comprising 1.6 million housing units, affecting approximately 6 million property owners. Faced with a crisis of unfinished buildings, the public usually takes actions such as organizing protests, petitioning the government, and pursuing legal rights. Without immediate changes, a social crisis would be imminent. A circulated video shows homeowners in Dongto Zhongyuan Fu community protesting as the developer failed to meet the promised handover date of April 30th. Another incident in Daxing Township, Xinchang City, Sichuan Province, local authorities deployed police and hundreds of civil servants to expropriate land from villagers. The conflict arose because the government planned to build the Xishang Expressway, and the compensation offered for the land was considered insufficient by the villagers, leading them to reject the expropriation demands. Similar protests occurred in Bingzhou, Shanxi province. The Xinjia Mansion project, which was supposed to be handed over four years ago, remains unfinished. Hundreds of homeowners gathered at the municipal government, hoping the government would help them acquire their homes. Many owners assembled outside the government office with banners reading, unscrupulous developer, no handover, no construction, returned our hard-earned money. But instead of assistance, they faced suppression by the police, with several individuals detained. Recently, an unfinished building protest also erupted in Shen County in Liaocheng of Shandong. Owners of the Mingsheng City Leader Project displayed banners outside the sales office. The banners read, Mingsheng is deceitful real estate, defrauding owners of their hard-earned money. We refuse to accept the property. And another banner, Mingsheng sells homes, government assists oppressing the people, we will never accept the property. Several protest banners layered together formed a wall filled with the grievances of the people. Since last year, 
Homeowners of unfinished buildings across various regions have responded by issuing joint statements, refusing to pay loans, hoping to pressure local governments and developers to complete construction. The widespread occurrence of unfinished buildings is not unrelated to the lack of regulatory responsibility by banks. Under China's pre-sale system for houses, buyers' payments should be deposited into a supervised bank account, from which banks would gradually disperse funds based on the construction progress. However, due to the collusion between Chinese banks and the government, and because the banks are state-owned, once the purchase funds are deposited, the government almost completely takes away the portion from land sales, which is a major cost for developers. Furthermore, in Subsequent oversight, developers use various methods to deceive banks and secure the funds, leading to a financial breakdown and unfinished projects. Recently, many signs indicate that Chinese banks are on the brink of danger, suffering a fatal blow and barely hanging on. Analysts point out that the collapse of China's real estate market is closely linked to the bad debts of banks. Previously, the real estate sector accounted for about 30% of China's economic growth, and China has over 4,000 banks, all of which focused on entering the real estate sector during its rapid growth period. The CCP once propagated that real estate was an evergreen industry, but now the situation is completely different. The entire real estate market has collapsed, and almost all loans issued by banks to the real estate sector have turned into bad debts. Now, with a general decline in housing prices, some areas have even experienced drops of 20 to 30 percent. The value of mortgage debts has exceeded the value of properties themselves, meaning that bank loans are almost impossible to recover. Many people have now given up on repaying loans. As housing prices continue to fall in China, this situation will intensify, putting enormous pressure on commercial banks. If there is no strong government support, such as printing money to bail out banks, these banks will face bankruptcy. So far, the Chinese government has not taken any measures to address this, and most people are just watching. The core problem of the Chinese government is that it only follows Xi Jinping's directives. As the real estate crisis in China intensifies, regional banks are experiencing increasing pressure due to developers' inability to repay loans. As reported by Nikkei Asia, particularly small and medium-sized regional banks are facing severe bad debt issues, mainly due to their loans to financially strapped private enterprises. In the northeastern provinces of Jilin, Liaoning, and Heilongjiang, banks report a significant increase in bad loans and a sharp decline in net profits. For instance, the net profit of Jilin Jiutai Rural Commercial Bank fell by 90% year-on-year, while its bad real estate debts grew by 37%, making it one of the most impacted Chinese banks publicly listed in Hong Kong. It is reported that 31 banks have faced similar challenges, with Qingdao Bank notably experiencing a significant increase in bad debts from 2022 to 2023, this bank saw a 229% increase in bad loans to real estate developers, amounting to almost 522 million yuan. Overall, these 31 banks witnessed a 9.8% increase in real estate bad debts in 2023, reaching 29 billion yuan. Six banks experienced triple-digit growth in bad loans, while 17 banks saw growth in the double digits. This suggests that non-publicly listed regional banks are likely facing similar pressures. At the same time, some government affiliates affiliated major developers are also admitting to financial difficulties amid declining real estate sales. Moreover, this year, the People's Bank of China announced its first reduction in the five-year loan prime rate, LPR, in eight months by 25 basis points, bringing the rate for terms over five years to 3.95 percent. This is the first 25 basis point reduction in the five-year-plus LPR since the reform of the LPR system. This decision has garnered widespread attention. Some market observers suggest that the extent of the rate cut exceeded expectations and may be aimed at stimulating credit demand and revitalizing the real estate market. There are concerns that the government's policy to revive the real estate market might lead heavily indebted local governments to further expand infrastructure projects, exacerbating economic risks. Economically, the reduction in interest rates indicates that the Chinese economy is in a severe downturn, with insufficient corporate profits and declining incomes among the people. However, this rate cut further compresses banks' interest margins. The year 2023 has already been excruciating for banks, with a thin margin just over 1%, making survival extremely extremely challenging. The additional cut of 0.5% could be devastating for smaller city commercial banks and rural commercial banks. It is noteworthy that as of the end of 2023, the average net interest margin for all types of banks in China was 1.69%, with interest margin income accounting for 80.1% of the banking industry's revenue. Essentially, banks depend on their interest margins for survival. 
among all banks, city commercial banks had the lowest net interest margin at just 1.57%. In terms of profits and bad loans, all banks had profits of approximately 2.4 trillion yuan and bad loans totaling 3.2 trillion yuan, with bad loans amounting to 1.3 times the profits. Specifically, city commercial banks had profits of 293 billion yuan and bad loans of 502 billion yuan, making the scale of bad loans 1.7 times the profits. Rural commercial banks had profits of 239 billion yuan and bad loans of 862 billion yuan, making the scale of bad loans 3.6 times the profits. With sharply shrinking interest margins, the profits of these two types of banks could be completely devoured by their enormous bad loans. A senior analyst commented online, the most frightening aspect is that the 1.69% was the average net interest margin for the entire year of 2023, meaning that by the fourth quarter, the net interest margin had only been 1.53%. Dissident Han Lian Chao had a discussion with a friend who has deep insights into the workings of the party state system. When asked whether an economic crisis that prevents the government from paying salaries could lead to internal defection, his friend replied that it was impossible, the reason being that the frontline enforcers who protect Xi Jinping's life and power will only see their salaries increase, not decrease. More importantly, everyone is running their own scam where they take advantage of others, and power determines the extent of the scam. If salaries are cut, they can simply compensate for losses inside with gains from outside. Additionally, China's economic growth is slowing, foreign capital continues to flow out, and the government's long-term accumulated debt is nearing an uncontrollable amount. To raise funds, Beijing plans to have the public invest in various bonds. The People's Bank of China recently issued a notice on over-the-counter bond market services, allowing investors from May 1st to invest in government bonds, local bonds, financial bonds, and corporate credit bonds over the counter. The official narrative claims that the current scale of government bonds held by Chinese residents is small compared to the mature bond markets, offering a significant potential for improvement. By investing in the bond market, savings can be converted into investments, increasing residents' income. Some analysts point out that behind these positive statements, the government is out of options and is attempting to have the people fill in fiscal gaps. Currently, China's land finance system has collapsed, leaving local governments without tax collection tools ultimately forcing them to issue new debt to pay off old debts to keep government operations running. However, these debts are payable, potentially leading to severe inflation in the future.